What if I told you that a single ancient culture of maybe 40,000 people managed to spread their genes, languages, and culture to literally billions of people across the entire globe? It sounds impossible, right? But that's exactly what happened with one small nomadic group of people. Today, their genetic legacy can be found in Europeans, Indians, Iranians, Central Asians, and through later migrations, even in the Americas and parts of Africa. Their languages evolved into everything from English to Hindi to Russian to Spanish. Their cultural innovations, from wheeled transport to horse domestication, transformed human civilization. They were the product of an incredibly complex mixing event that brought together peoples from four different regions across a vast area stretching from Central Asia to the Caucasus Mountains. So buckle up, because we're about to trace one of the most extraordinary population expansions in human history, from a handful of nomadic herders to the ancestors of nearly half the world's population. As you may have guessed, we are referring to the Yamnaya culture, attributed to Proto-Indo-Europeans, but we will start with the most shocking revelation from this new research. The Yamnaya didn't emerge from a single place. Instead, they were the product of a massive mixing event that brought together peoples from four distinct regions, each contributing their own unique genetic and cultural elements. The first component came from along the Volga River, where researchers have identified a fascinating genetic gradient. Moving from upstream to downstream along the Volga, eastern hunter-gatherer ancestry gradually decreased while Caucasus-related ancestry increased. This wasn't a sharp boundary, but a gradual climb that shows how populations were already mixing and moving along this crucial waterway. The second component came from the Caucasus Mountains, particularly from populations like those found at Akhnashen in Armenia. These Caucasian peoples were already highly mixed, roughly 60% Mesopotamian farmers and 40% Caucasus hunter-gatherers. They were the bridge between the agricultural civilizations of the Near East and the hunter-gatherer populations of the Northern Steppes. The third component originated in Ukraine, where we find the Dnipro Klein and Ukrainian hunter-gatherers. These were the descendants of Mesolithic foragers who had been living along Ukraine's major rivers for thousands of years. They knew the landscape intimately and had developed sophisticated ways of exploiting the rich resources of the forest steppe boundary. They also themselves had roughly half of admixture that can be seen as Eastern hunter-gatherer-like, while the other half is from Western hunter-gatherers. The fourth component came from Central Asia, specifically from populations related to the Tutkal culture. Tutkal admixture was noted in eastern hunter-gatherers present on the Volga Klein. These were ancient peoples who lived in what's now Tajikistan and surrounding areas. They brought with them a deep ancestral connection to the vast Eurasian steppes and likely contributed crucial knowledge about surviving in these harsh, semi-arid environments. To give you an idea of how these populations relate, Many of them have a common ancestor in ancient North Eurasians. Ancient North Eurasians make up roughly 70 to 80% of ancestry in Eastern hunter-gatherers and Tutkal Central Asian individuals. Caucasus hunter-gatherers and Ukraine hunter-gatherers also possess their admixture in ranges of between 10 and 40%. Paternally, this population is the ancestor of Eastern hunter-gatherers and Tutkal individuals, and would, by extension, by the ancestor of Yamnaya and later Indo-European groups. What's remarkable is that this mixing wasn't random. It happened in a specific place at a specific time, around 4000 BCE in the region between the Don and Volga rivers. Here, three out of these different ancestral streams came together to create something entirely new, the CLV Klein, named after the Caucasus, Lower Volga, and related populations. This CLV Klein was the immediate ancestor of the Yamnaya. But even this wasn't the end of the mixing story. Around 4000 BCE, groups from this CLV Klein moved westward and encountered Ukrainian hunter-gatherers. This meeting produced what researchers call the Dnipro Klein, which gave rise to cultures like Sredny Stog and ultimately the Kor Yamnaya population. So ultimately, the Kor Yamnaya had two sources of EHG ancestry, which were Volga Klein and Ukraine hunter-gatherers, while also having two sources of CHG admixture as well, which were from the Volga Klein and Caucasus Enneolithic found at Akhnashen. The slight Tutkal admixture present in Volga individuals would also provide Iranian Neolithic admixture, while both Volga and Ukraine Neolithic also had Western hunter-gatherer admixture as well. Think about what this means. 
the people who would go on to spread Indo-European languages and genes across half the world were themselves the product of one of the most complex population mixing events in prehistoric Europe and Asia. They were a melting pot of different groups, however. Some of these groups ultimately shared ancestry through ANE mentioned earlier. Now here's where things get really interesting. The Yamnaya weren't content to stay on the steppes. Starting around 3000 BCE, they began one of the most consequential migrations in human history. Their first major target was the territory of the globular amphora culture in what's now Poland and surrounding areas. When Yamnaya pastoralists encountered these European farmers, something remarkable happened. Instead of simple conquest or replacement, we see the emergence of an entirely new culture, the Corded Ware culture. The Corded Ware people were genetically dominated by steppe ancestry. In many cases, they were 70 to 80% Yamnaya related, but they weren't just Yamnaya transplants. They had incorporated local European farmer knowledge, technologies, and some local genetic ancestry as well. This is crucial because the Corded Ware culture is thought to be ancestral to some of the most important Indo European language groups in Europe, Indo-Iranian, Slavic, Baltic, and Germanic peoples. When you hear Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, German, or English being spoken today, you're hearing the linguistic descendants of these Corded Ware people. But the expansion didn't stop there. Another culture further west in Europe that can be modeled as a mixture of Corded Ware and additional European farmer ancestry emerged. This meeting produced the Bell Beaker culture, which emerged around 2500 BCE. They maintained substantial steppe ancestry, but were more mixed with European farmers than their Corded Ware counterparts. And here's the kicker. The Bell Beakers are thought to be the ancestors of Celtic and Italic speakers. What's absolutely mind-blowing is the scale and speed of this transformation. In just a few centuries, Indo-European languages and substantial steppe ancestry spread from the Eastern European steppes all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Entire regions were linguistically and genetically transformed. It is estimated that at the beginning of the emergence of Kor Yamnaya culture, there were only 40,000 of these nomadic conquerors, but there were 7 million sedentary European farmers present in Europe. Fast forward to today, Europe has more than 700 million people, and their paternal ancestry is dominated by these nomadic Indo-Europeans. While their overall genetic profile is between one-third and one-half of that of Yamnaya steppe people. This wasn't solely a violent conquest, though there was certainly conflict. Instead, it seems to have been a combination of factors. Superior technology, especially wheeled vehicles and horse domestication, favorable climate conditions, and possibly advantages in social organization and disease resistance. Considering the high proliferation of Yamnaya paternal lineages in modern Europe and a stable level of Western hunter-gatherer lineages, while the Anatolian farmer lineages are extremely low, despite being the largest overall genetic component of Europeans, it stands to reason that there was possibly large male replacement, as well as hypergamy present, that pushed Yamnaya paternal lineages to the top. While Indo-Europeans were transforming Europe, they were simultaneously spreading eastward across Asia in what would become an even more complex and far-reaching expansion. The first wave eastward was the Afanasievo culture, which emerged around 3000 BCE. These were essentially Yamnaya people, who decided to head east instead of west. They traveled enormous distances, eventually reaching what's now western China and Mongolia. But here's what's fascinating. As they moved east, they didn't remain genetically unchanged. Along the way, they picked up minor West Siberian hunter-gatherer ancestry and some East Eurasian Paleo-Siberian admixture. The Afanasievo people eventually evolved into the Tocharian peoples, speakers of Tocharian languages that were documented in Central Asian manuscripts before disappearing entirely. Today, their genetic legacy lives on as part of modern Uyghur ethnogenesis, though the Tocharian languages themselves are extinct. There's also a fascinating connection to the famous Tarim mummies, those remarkably preserved bodies found in Western China that look European, but date to around 2000 BCE. For years, people thought these might be descendants of the Afanasievo expansion, but the new genetic evidence tells a different story. The Tarim mummies were actually descended from an even more ancient population called ANE, ancient North Eurasians, whom we mentioned earlier. 
They were ancestral to Indo-Europeans, but never made the journey to Europe themselves. The Tarim people were mainly of a &E ancestry mixed with Bronze Age Siberian populations. They represent a parallel branch of the ancient population that contributed to Indo-European ethnogenesis, but they weren't Indo-Europeans themselves. The second and more impactful wave of Asian expansion came with the Indo-Iranian peoples, who formed the Sintashta and Andronovo cultures around 2000 BCE. These cultures split off from the fatyanovo abashevo cultures of Eastern Europe and headed southeast into Central Asia. This second wave would leave a lasting impact on Asia that continues to this day. Pars of these Indo-Iranian populations mixed with Paleo-Siberian peoples to create the infamous Scythians, the horse-riding nomads who would dominate the Eurasian steppes for centuries. Other branches of these Indo-Iranian peoples went south and mixed with the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex, BMAC, to create the Yaz culture. Still others continued even further south, crossing the Hindu Kush mountains and establishing Indo-Aryan languages in the Indian subcontinent. The impact of these migrations was staggering. Today, all Turkic peoples of Asia, Iranic people, Finno-Ugrian people, most of Indian people, and even Mongolic people carry Indo-European admixture. The ancestry spread even further through secondary migrations. Medieval Turkic peoples, having received Indo-European ancestry through Scythian admixture, spread this genetic signature throughout Asia during their age of conquests. This is how even Mongols came to carry traces of Indo-European ancestry, not through direct contact, but mediated through Turkic admixture. Today, only a few Asian populations lack any trace of this ancient steppe ancestry. Koreans, Japanese, Southeast Asians, and Southern Chinese peoples. Everywhere else in Asia, you can find the genetic signature of those Bronze Age Indo-European migrations. But the story doesn't end in ancient times. The final phase of Indo-European genetic spread came through European colonialism starting in the 15th century CE. When Europeans began exploring and colonizing the Americas, they brought with them not just their languages and cultures, but their genes. Today, hundreds of millions of people in North and South America carry European ancestry and speak Indo-European languages. The same process happened in parts of Africa, Australia, and Oceania. European colonial settlements, slave trade movements, and modern migrations have spread Indo-European ancestry to every continent on Earth. What started as a mixing event involving maybe 40,000 people on the Eastern European steppes has now reached billions of people across the globe. The Yabnaya genetic signature can be found in a software engineer in Silicon Valley, a farmer in rural India, a shopkeeper in Tehran, animal herder in Mongolia, a teacher in Moscow, and a rancher in Argentina. Let's put this in perspective. The Indo-European expansion is arguably the most successful population expansion in human history. Today, Indo-European languages are spoken by nearly 3 billion people, almost half the world's population. The genetic ancestry that traces back to the Yamnaya can be found in an even larger number of people when you account for mixed populations. This success wasn't due to any inherent superiority of Indo-European peoples. Instead, it was the result of a perfect storm of factors. Technological innovations like wheeled transport and horse domestication, favorable climate conditions during the Bronze Age, strategic geographic position at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, and probably some advantages in social organization and disease resistance. The Yamnaya expansion also shows us how complex human migrations really are. This wasn't a simple story of one population conquering others. It was a series of mixing events, cultural exchanges, and gradual transformations that played out over thousands of years. The original Yamnaya were themselves the product of mixing between four different ancestral populations. As they expanded, they continued mixing with local populations, creating new hybrid cultures and genetic profiles. The Corded Ware people were different from the Yamnaya, the Bell Beakers were different from the Corded Ware people, and so on. What we see is not genetic or cultural purity, but rather a continuous process of mixing, adaptation, and innovation. The Indo-Europeans were never a single unified people. They were a constantly evolving network of related populations, sharing similar languages, technologies, and cultural practices. The Yamnaya story teaches us some profound lessons about human history and migration. First, it shows us that major population expansions are often the result of technological and social innovations rather than simple demographic pressure. The Yamnaya didn't spread because they were overcrowded. They spread because they had developed superior technologies and social systems. 
Second, it demonstrates that successful migrations usually involve mixing rather than replacement. The most successful Indo-European populations were those that incorporated local knowledge, technologies, and genetic ancestry rather than simply imposing their own culture. Third, it reveals how interconnected the ancient world really was. The mixing event that created the Yamnaya brought together peoples from Central Asia, Ukraine, the Volga region, and the Caucasus Mountains. This kind of long-distance connectivity and cultural exchange was happening thousands of years before we usually think of the world as being globalized. Finally, it shows us that the categories we use to understand ethnicity and ancestry, European, Asian, Indo-European, are much more fluid and complex than we often assume. The people we call Indo-Europeans were the product of mixing between multiple ancestral populations and continued mixing with local populations wherever they went. There is also a paradox where some people of Dagestan, despite carrying some of the highest levels of Yamnaya ancestry, do not speak Indo-European languages. Meanwhile, Sardinians, who are only one-fifth Indo-European genetically, do speak an Indo-European language. The same is reflected in the Asian side of steppe ancestry. The people with the most Proto-Indo-Iranian Andronovo ancestry are people like Udmurts and Komis, yet they do not speak Indo-European languages. They instead speak Finno-Ugric languages, while Persians, Balochis, and Central and South Indians carry little amounts of this ancestry, but instead not only speak a variation of their language, but also strongly tie themselves to Andronovo people in terms of ethnic identity. The next time you hear someone speaking English, Spanish, Russian, Hindi, or Persian, remember that you're witnessing the end result of one of the most extraordinary population expansions in human history. Those 40,000 Yamnaya pastoralists didn't just change the world, they became the world.